Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gabe Tylove. I'm uh, the vice chair for your um, for your education community here. Um, you can see there's some um, best practices up on the screen. Um, today is a discussion forum. This isn't going to be just a, a PowerPoint. We want to hear from all of you um, what's working, what's not, um, and sort of uh, together sort of get a, a vision looking forward. So we are going to ask you just to be on mute until you're ready to talk. Um, but then you can you have the capability to unmute yourself. So we're hoping you just kind of dynamically join the conversation. Um, introduce yourself the first time you talk, just so we have a sense of who's in the room. Um, you can turn your uh, video on and off selectively, um, in, entirely up to you. Um, don't be shy. So you know, if, if please, we want to hear from as many voices as possible. Um, and with that in mind, uh, try to let everyone share. So. Um, you know, if you have a lot to say, that's we, we want to hear it, but also make sure you're leaving room for other folks. And then um, as there are resources or ideas that come, please use the chat box. We will save the chat for, for later. So any resources you have, links to your programs or programs you've seen that you admire, put them there so that we can preserve them uh, for the future. Um, before we get into things, I wanted to introduce you to Christy Weber, um, your chair. Um, so Christy, uh, uh, welcome. Is there anything you'd like to, to say to the group? Um, no, just welcome everybody again. Thanks for signing up for these. Um, right now we have one more scheduled for next Thursday. Uh, uh, Joan was, you know, mentioning that in the sense that, you know, we want to try breakout rooms um, that are kind of uh, topic specific, if you will, for like teacher programming and adult ed and um, allow people to talk more in a smaller uh, group setting. So um, if you haven't registered for that, um, go ahead and, and do that. I think Gabe posted or Joan posted um, both of these sessions, today's and next week's um, on the education board um, and they have the registration links right there. So it's easy to get yourself uh, registered for that. So um, again, thanks and thanks Gabe for, um, you know, spearheading this session with a focus on adult ed. And um, also we are um, capturing notes, a nice call out to one of my colleagues, Caroline uh, Spittle, who is online as well, if you will, and uh, helping us kind of capture um, the thoughts that, uh, that come up today. Thanks, Christy. I'm just going to go to the next slide here. Um, so this is sort of a general outline of what I'm hoping we'll discuss today. Um, we can certainly go into other topics as well, but I thought this would help frame things. Um, what programs have transitioned best to online or distance learning for you? Um, and we can, you know, we can address that either from a student engagement standpoint or from a revenue generation standpoint. Um, how are you supporting um, your either staff or contracted instructors to find success in, in the sort of new distance learning teaching medium, whether that be Zoom or WebEx or, or some, other, um, some other medium? How are you supporting those folks to make sure they're successful? Um, and what are some of the important details that you found to kind of get, get things right to make sure we're having engaging experiences, um, effective experiences, and actually creating a fun learning environment? Um, so those, those are some of the discussion points I, I, I'm hoping we can, we can discuss today. Um, in general, you know, I know that many of our gardens are closed. Um, there's no in-person uh, classes or programs. And, you know, a, a challenge is even as these restrictions lift state to state, uh, there might be some reticence from our core participants to sort of flood back in and crowd a, crowd a classroom. And so um, even though, you know, right now there's sort of a, an audience locked at home, we expect that distance learning is probably going to be a part of many of our programs, you know, for the next several months. Um, and, and so adult education, I think is actually in a very fortunate position compared to many of our education colleagues, whether that be youth education, summer camps, on-site programming, is that it's, it's a little bit easier for us to transition to online than for many of our colleagues. And so that um, does put us, I think, in a, in a unique situation where we are taking the lead in many cases from a, um, an audience engagement standpoint, and even maybe from a little bit of revenue generation, um, cover, helping to cover um, our, our staff, um, our staff salaries when our organizations are in tough financial times. So um, I think uh, that's sort of how I want to frame this. I think we are in a, a fortunate position um, within our organizations to be able to continue to put out programming. And I'm hoping that all of us can support one another to get up to speed as, as fast as we can. And for, for Botanic Gardens to really take the lead in our communities, um, educating around horticulture, sustainability, and, and the environment and all the other great things that we teach about. So 
with that said, I'm going to I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, so that we can see as many of us as possible. And um, I'm just hoping there is some brave soul who's willing to step up first, introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what's happening at their institution. And then um, we'll hear from um, as many people as we can. So um, anyone who'd like to kick things off for us. Hi, I'll, I'll kick things off. Thanks, Susan. Um, I am Susan from the New Orleans Botanical Garden. And um, actually, we haven't done anything at this point. <laughs> and so that's what I'm trying to figure out. What is the best thing to do and where we should spend our resources right now? Because, you know, everything's so tight and limited. And uh, you talked about um, instructor support. Well, I don't even think I can get instructors in here. So everything that we do is probably going to have to be just in-house. And, um, and maybe uh, bring in some LSU Ag, Ag Center uh, from LSU or something like that because they're close by. So, um, yeah, so I'm here to, to hopefully you all give us some guidance on uh, what works and what doesn't work so far. I feel like I'm out of the loop. <laughs> well, thanks, Susan. That's that's great. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned sort of connecting with local, you know, ag folks, you know, people at the local university, tapping into people who already have sort of maybe some experience with online learning or sort of um, a lot of presentations already together, maybe still are still working. So that's uh, that's a great suggestion right, right there. So thanks for sharing that. Sure. Yeah, hi, um, this is Jessica Farmer. I am at the University of Washington Botanic Gardens in Seattle. And um, of course, you know, right out of the gate, we just canceled or rescheduled all kinds of stuff. And we're actually coming up on the reschedule dates for the in-person programming, which we are now moving to online. Um, things that were supposed to happen in March, we rescheduled to May or June, and, and here we are. So um, what we just got started actually last week was our, our first, um, online class. We had our second last night. Um, I, you know, we're, I think, really fortunate being positioned within a university that because the university academics has all moved to online classes, all faculty and staff too, um, like us, get uh, Zoom Pro accounts through the university. So I'd say if anybody's connected to instructors who are through a university, they may have similar um, platforms available to them at no extra cost. Sorry, I have a cat that likes to come to these meetings too. So there he goes. Um, uh, we're learning. Um, I'm trying to figure out in terms of a June uh, conference that I'm planning to move online, whether I need to purchase, actually, I'm gonna go ahead and purchase the Zoom webinar um, software beyond just Zoom meetings, because I think that allows a little more functionality for um, having multiple panelists presenters, but the meetings alone has worked just fine for a single session presenter class um, for like an hour or hour and a half. And we can just use the chat box for, for Q&A. Um, the welcome slide that you put up, we've implemented a similar thing, giving people some mm -hmm. tips of how, what kind of the etiquette is and, and how to function if they're not comfortable Zoom users. Um, and we're also really working a lot on different ways to engage people whether it's through polls or um, mm -hmm. like last night's instructor didn't want to do formal polls because those require multiple choice answers, but he just wanted to put up pictures. It was on plant morphology. So he like put up a picture of a celery stalk and he's like, what part of the plant is this? And then people could just chat, type into the chat box what, mm -hmm. what kinds of things they thought. So we're still playing around with um, how to best engage people, but, but we're rolling and, and now looking rather than just moving things we already had scheduled to online, looking to more proactively create new online content. Jessica, can I ask you, um, the, the, those classes, or, um, those are, are paid learning experiences or, or free? Yeah, they are fee-based. Um, that's how we fund our education staff salaries is, is through fees. We don't have a um, membership program or a gate fee. Or, so even if we were open, uh, we don't have those kind of funding sources. Um, so we've got to be self-supporting. And at this point, we're not going to come anywhere close, but it'll be something's better than nothing. Um, and uh, as for now, we're charging similar to what we charged in the classroom. Um, 
last week's class was an hour and a half and we charged $28 per person. Um, the one happening last night and tonight, it's broken into two one hour sessions and we charge $20. I'm sure we have like dual household, like two people in a household who are probably watching together that might have paid two registrations to come together in person. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we're losing a lot, based, you know, through that kind of thing. What are the moments? Oh, we've had um, 20 to 30 people, which is super comfortable for me just getting started. Um, we can try and build mm -hmm. it up bigger later, but I don't want to have 100 people in the room while we're still learning. That's great. Thanks, Jessica. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Kate Sorensen from the Bellevue Botanical Garden, not far from Jessica in Washington. And uh, we're also a small botanical garden that doesn't have a gate fee. Um, and we, we are just starting webinars next week. I called you to a botanical and talked with Sasha last week just to kind of get some inspiration and get ready to take the plunge. So we are set up on Zoom webinar and there's just two of us in our staff who are trying to get up to speed. And we are starting with some free webinars just to get our feet wet. And then we have some others that we are bringing in from the community. Um, one of them is going to charge us a hundred dollars fee and and then another one is looking at a three hundred dollar fee so for that three hundred dollar fee we might want to get up to at least a hundred members and we'll probably do our we probably will do a little lower we usually do 25 35 for in-person classes we'll probably do more like 10 and 20. Mm -hmm. There was a, a, a follow-up question in the chat. I think it was for Jessica, but, um, it, but it, you know, Kate, you could also respond to this too. Just talking about um, program promotion, how are you doing that? Is it sort of the normal channels or have you taken a different approach um, for online classes? For us, it's our normal approach. Most of our programs have been filling up um, from our e-blasts and, mm -hmm. and our social media. And that's been true for our in-person classes as well. So um, we're not gonna really change anything that way. Yeah, it's similar for us. We've done um, you know, e-newsletters and our um, social media. Uh, we've been watching what other gardens are doing and we've done a lot bigger um, emphasis on you know, engaging from home and that kind of thing. And I'm gonna meet with our website person tomorrow to talk about if we want to centralize a place on our website for all our different online resources, right now they're still spread out to all the different departments where those programs are based. Uh, one, one small anecdote I'll share is, you know, education for us is always fighting with all of um, our general garden marketing, you know, sort of, yeah, you know, we're trying to get sell, we're trying to sell tickets in the door. And so it's hard for us to compete with that. This is the first time in the 10 years I've been at the garden that education is leading the way in sort of our social media posts and other things. So it is, a, there is a unique moment right here. To, uh, <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, yeah maybe I'll, I'll share what we're doing. And we had a really similar experience because um, our marketing department has been a lot more excited to share our online classes with our e-newsletter because it's, it's, you know, it's an option for everybody. And so I'm Daniel and I'm at Coastal Maine Botanical Garden. So a lot of the people on our list, because we are in a rural area, don't necessarily live close by. I mean, we have vacation to Maine. Uh, but so for us, it's, this has turned into a pretty neat opportunity um, because all of a sudden we can offer something to a much wider swath of people that are somehow they're connected to us, but it doesn't necessarily work to take a class in person. Um, and so I've noticed that we've been, we haven't had our classes featured in the e-blast more than they typically get featured. And one of the things I've noticed in who's signing up, we have a much higher percentage of non-members signing up. And I typically have, I don't know what other people's benchmarks are, but I typically have like 90% members sign up for classes. And the online programs we've started have been more like 65% members. 
Um, so that's been neat to see. Um, Daniel, are there particular um, topics you're you're focusing on for online to sort of draw in that that broader, wider audience, or is it the same things you already had scheduled? Or um, what's your what are your thoughts there? Uh, you're muted uh, right now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so we did a mix, and it was it was quite confusing at first. We postponed some classes, we canceled some classes, we moved some to an online format. We moved some to an online format, but changed the time so that the block time would be too long. So we took a lot of three hour classes and made them two 90 minute classes. Um, so, and then we also created some new programs and the new programs are, they are kind of designed to be, um, to I think I'll say the challenge that we've had, I think it's been neat to see so many people come into these programs that have never taken a class before. What has been challenging is it is it pretty labor intensive. So we've got the person teaching the class and we're trying to do most of our classes in person that they're, they're not a webinar. They're actually um, like our pruning class is that with a chat person. So there's something we film in person teaching and then we have this kind of support person. So with, with when we've had 30 to 35 in some of these classes, there's one to three people that some things they're not successfully logging in. And the first few that we did, there it wasn't, you know, their email the instructor who's on staff instructor and said not email, well, you can't email the instructor when the class is happening. So we realized they need to have a point person for technical issues. There's the person teaching, and then there's kind of a moderator for some of the filming. So I haven't given out any conclusions yet, but on the one hand, it does feel like we just started something new that we may want to keep doing after this period is over. But the one thing that gives me pause is it's taking a couple of staff resources. So normally, we, we say hi to class and walk away. The instructor is the only person that's involved with that class. But right now, it does actually feel like there are three people involved to some degree with the class, the tech support person being the smallest. But um, I'm still sort of figuring out how it's how to streamline it. You know, it's just, it, it hasn't felt super streamlined, you know, to it, all those different moving parts. Yeah, and I, I'll share that that's very similar experience um, for us where we've got the instructor. Um, usually um, at home, so they're maybe just filming themselves. They might, in, depending on the class, they may have someone helping them film. Um, then a staff person, usually myself as a host who started it, who welcomes people, who's managing the chat, who's muting and unmuting and sort of taking care of the technical stuff. Um, so that's, that's two, at least two, sometimes three right there. And so a very yeah. similar experience for me at, at, uh, at FIPS. Yeah. yeah. And we're charging similar prices, I think, per hour, as people are describing. Um, oh, so we, the ones that were three hours long and we were in two, we kept their original price, which is around $36, $38 for a three-hour class. So we took our, our program that we designed specifically to be online for just one hour, and they are $10 to $12, depending on the member and non-member. So, um, on the one hand, there's more people in them, but they really are more affordable, which I think also for this moment is nice. They can bring a lot of people in, um, but it still to me raises a question, even with 30 people in them, um, they don't bring as much as long in person. So, so I don't know, still lots of audience for questions. We felt like we had to keep them somewhat affordable. Our local attention is a lot of reprogramming. Um, our local reprogramming so we felt like um, we needed to think about how what about our programs adds extra value but also it had to be price sensitive thanks Daniel I appreciate your your insights um,
Yeah, please, Christy. I'm ahead. Christy from the Buffalo and Erie County Botanical Gardens. Hi, everyone. So we're kind of working with a lot of similar stuff as uh, you folks are. So we were trying to figure out what we could transition online um, out of all of our programs. So the easiest thing for us was our horticulture classes. So we did have to like move some dates around while we were trying to figure out if things should be rescheduled. And once we realized uh, we got to switch gears here, um, it seemed pretty easy to transition these classes because um, they're a lecture based class. So we could do share screen through Zoom. So that's what we ended up doing. We had our very first one this last Saturday. And most of the participants that were registered um, stayed to do the online class and we were able to pick up a couple extra folks as well. Uh, we kept the price point the same. Um, we, it's, a, it's about a two hour class and um, our education coordinator, Jolene, who's also on this call is very good with technology. So she acted as the host for the meeting and our instructor was able to work with her to make sure everything went smoothly. Um, if people were interacting in the chat box. She was helpful to relay questions. And we also figured out, um, we usually pass out like a quiz that people can do. She figured out how to make it like a PowerPoint option so we could go through the quiz and the quiz could be filled in with folks. Cause we weren't really sure like how to manage everybody possibly talking at once with the answers for the quiz. And it seemed to work out well. Um, so that inspired us to kind of think outside the box a little bit more, try to figure out what else we could offer in a similar format. So we have a wide outreach program um for lectures so we go to garden clubs and we go to libraries and do community-based lectures so we're going to try a lecture series at a lower price point um, for those classes and offer them similarly and then we've also been doing videos so with tomorrow being arbor day i took a whole bunch of short videos in front of some trees and our marketing team put it into one big video and we're going to share that out for free on our facebook page tomorrow so that's what we were able to kind of do easily. What we're struggling to think of right now are our more hands-on classes, like how do you do a floral arrangement online and particularly our art classes for adults. Not sure how to make that happen. Um, hey, this is Libby um, from the U.S. Botanic Garden. Um, just uh, responding to the online art classes, we have a bunch of instructors that uh, also do education for like high schools and such. And so they've worked really hard on mm -hmm. in their communities transitioning to um, online learning. So if you reach out to your local school community, if you don't utilize instructors who um, maybe have that experience, they're really good with um, figuring out mechanisms and ways of getting people to connect online through pro uh, art type programs. Um, but we did find that it's about for what we have coming up anyway and working with our instructors about 45 minutes is like the max time that any person mm -hmm. can kind of sit and listen and engage and, and do as any sort of art project. So um, that's just my, my two cents for, for art, art related programs, but they also have been very popular. So people seem really excited, especially like 101 type introductory, let's paint for non artist kind of type classes um, seem to be really popular right now. So all of our programs are, are free online. Um, so that is mm -hmm. another consideration for us as well. We also are not allowed to use Zoom. So if you're really interested to hear from anybody who has similar constraints, um, apparently it's not secure enough for a government environment. So because um, we are part of the legislative branch. So we're uh, exploring Adobe Connect uh, right now. But if anyone has any experience with that or other platforms other than Zoom, I'd also be interested to hear about that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Libby, have you looked into, um, oh gosh, GoToMeeting? Yeah, we've been using that some at work. I've been using Zoom more for things like this, but um, GoToMeeting seems to have kind of a similar setup, if you will. Yeah, we've used that before with contractors and people who come in to um, provide sort of like meetings related to other projects, but never for classes. So yeah, we might we might look into that as well. Our, the agency that, uh, that we're part of already uses Adobe products. So that was an easier oh, um, yeah. grab for much con contractually and trying to work through all the, the government tape. Um, but yeah, it, uh, that's, a, that's a, another good suggestion that we could definitely look into. Thank you. Oh, certainly. Hi, I'm Harriet from Van Dusen Botanical Garden in Vancouver and I just wanted to jump in about the art classes because um, we ran our botanical illustration class for the first time yesterday um, mm -hmm. and it was really successful and um, we ran it through Zoom and we had quite a small group. There was eight participants 
um, and we managed to keep it quite interactive. Our instructor um, had a, a great setup with um, the front camera of her computer and then a separate camera that she was able to use for her demonstrations. So as she was sharing her screen, participants could see her demonstrating and her plant that she was drawing from. Um, and yeah, it was, it, it worked really well. We did it instead of the usual three hour session that we would have had at the garden um, with a short break in the middle. Um, and it, it managed to stay very engaging and everyone seemed to really enjoy it. Um, so there's definitely hope. <laughs> Harriet, can I ask you, because I'm also interested in this uh, art topic here, um, was, were there any issues with um, color or sort of like uh, washing out of the image? I've heard some issues associated with that from artists worrying about how things will show up on white paper. Just were, was there any consideration that went into that or did it, just, did it just work for you? Yeah, so I had multiple meetings with the instructor beforehand, um, testing out her different cameras and seeing how the quality was and what different lighting would work and that kind of thing. Um, and because she was just sketching, um, there wasn't much, well, we weren't working with colour, so I can't comment on that. But um, we, we worked with kind of different camera angles and making sure she had the right lighting so that the contrast was clear enough so that um, as she was doing lighter sketches, participants could still see what she was doing. And I think the quality was really good. Um, yeah, she did a really good job. One other follow-up question uh, to that. Um, for that sort of three hour session where people are, there's maybe some presentation, but also people are drawing and it's sort of a longer period. Do people just leave their microphones on where they muted, but then could sort of ask for, for inf uh, instruction from um, the, presenter or what was that dynamic like between the instructor and students in that longer class? Yeah, so we, we did shorten it to two hours um, oh. and we had a very small group. So there was eight participants and at the start we asked everyone to mute their microphone if they had any kind of background noise, but kind of through the class interaction increased and by the kind of halfway through everyone was unmuted but just jumping in as and when they felt they they needed a bit of guidance and there wasn't I don't I don't recall there being any kind of talking over each other or that kind of thing everyone was very respectful and and just happy to be there and and mm -hmm. to be communicating with people outside of their house it was great I'm, I'm glad you brought that up and it's something that I want to also sort of just pose to the rest of you as well as you're sharing your experiences is you know, as much as we're sharing information, which is really valuable, um, a lot of times our education classes end up being communities of people who are interested in the same subject. And so finding ways not just to sort of share information, but also create that sort of community mm -hmm. dynamic can be something that's going to really be bringing pe people back um, week after week. And so um, I'm glad to hear that worked well for you. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, Harriet, um, Nancy Sharp has a question that has come up in the chat for you. Did mm -hmm. the instructor who you're just uh, speaking of, did they already have online teaching experience? So they just were able to kind of readily get right into this? Or um, could you talk a little bit more about that part of it? Yeah, um, she had run one course previously online um, the previous week, I think. Um, using a different platform called Blue Jeans. Um, and but that was her very first experience of teaching online. So she was she was nervous to jump into this format because um, the the class that she'd done previously was a one-off workshop. And I think that one was a longer one. I think um, maybe four or five hours that she still managed to run as a as a, a one-time workshop. Um, mm -hmm. And she said that it had gone well, um, but this we're running as a, an eight part course. Um, so it's shorter classes that we'll be doing weekly uh, through the spring. And yeah, she was, she was a little nervous to set up for this, um, for this class. But I think now that we've got a few teething problems out of the way, uh, it'll be really, really good moving forward, so. Excellent, thank you. Who else would like to jump in? Tell us what they're doing. Hi, this is Jillian. I'm also from Van Dusen Botanical Garden in Vancouver. Okay. And just to add a little bit to what Harriet has just said, um, 
First of all, I wanted to say that uh, all the people that were registered in that class, well, the vast majority actually, um, had already registered for the class before the shutdown. So we purposely made the decision that we were not opening up it up more broadly for registration. We were just trying it out with this group as we transitioned to that, to this format. But the only person that we allowed to attend the class was actually the mother of somebody who was also enrolled who joined from Manitoba. So it was a really lovely way to build that community and for that family to get together in that way. So, um, but the other piece I wanted to add was about uh, what we're in the works working on um, that we haven't offered yet, but hope to within two, three weeks. So we're partnering with a local gardening company in Vancouver that has better access to outdoor sites at this time. So the idea is that we're gonna partner with them that uh, we will host the classes and we do it through Zoom, but also it's linked to an educational platform called Thinkific. So we are now using Thinkific. Um, so we're able to do things like um, through the course hosting on Thinkific, we can give them materials in advance and we can give them lists of materials to assemble for the class or links to other, to anything we wanna give to them, we can host on that site as well. Um, so what we're doing is working with this company to present classes that'll be a combination of screen share PowerPoint, question and answering, but then live demos in the gardens that they have access to at the time. So we're hoping this will be a great new format. And what we've really done in terms of identifying the content, because this is all new content classes, with the exception of one modification of a class, that's how to engage kids in the garden. Um, but what we're really doing basically is capitalizing or taking advantage of this incredible boom and in interest in gardening during this time and recognizing that a huge number of these new gardeners are novices. They don't know what they're doing. So let's, let's target these courses at that entry level for the most part and open them up more broadly, lower the price point and really not necessarily working with our existing audiences at all, but really broadening it out and um, sort of recognizing everybody's interested. And the other piece I always think too is, okay, now everybody wants to start gardening. What's gonna happen when all the water restrictions kick in and they have no familiarity with, with how to manage that? So we're sort of letting that burgeoning interest sort of define our themes right now. With that. And, uh, uh, Jillian, I would echo that um, here in Pittsburgh. Uh, we, we put together a new offering, sort of uh, cobbling together things we already had uh, for a four-part vegetable gardening series this, this May, or excuse me, this April. And um, just interest was, is, has been through the roof. So we've, uh, we started off, we had 60 some people the first week, second week we were up to 90 and we just sold out at 100 for week two. And it's 12 or $14 classes. I mean, it's not very expensive, but I can make a lot more money actually with these classes than I would have for a 15 or 20 person in-person class. And just like you're saying, and, and Daniel was saying, this is not my typical audience. It's not names I recognize. It's not our volunteers. It's not our master gardeners. There's some of those people there, but it is, um, it's the general public. So I, I agree that one of the big benefits of this is, you know, spring is naturally the time that most people are excited about gardening anyway. We're very fortunate that that um, we happen to have a captive audience right now. So I think you're right on sort of simplifying and then you know broadening the audience because there's a real opportunity to engage that way. So thank, thanks for sharing that. Um, I can share a little bit. Um, so my name is Ben. I'm with the North Carolina Botanical Gardens. Um, first of all, this has just been such a wonderful resource. Um, I'm kind of new to the gardening world. Um, coming from Michigan uh, down here to the Botanical Gardens. And uh, yeah, and events like these has just been wonderful and getting all of this wonderful information from everyone. So thank you everyone for sharing. Um, I can give you a little bit of kind of an idea of what we're up to and it echoes a lot of what's already been said. Um, I think we're starting to see, you know, a silver lining in this whole pandemic is that the interest in online and distance education is just booming. Um, and we are a garden that traditionally did not offer online programming. Um, so this is a, a great way for us to start experimenting with how to use online programming and distance education to our advantage and how to actually reach out to new audiences that might not have interacted with the garden before. Um, so one of the first steps that we took is we got our upgrade from 
uh, just Zoom meetings to Zoom webinar. And we actually ran our first online Zoom webinar last week. Um, we usually host a bi-monthly uh, lunchbox talk lecture series um, that's very, very popular at the gardens that covers a range of topics. So we thought, okay, that's a good low hanging fruit for us to start off with. That's an easy format to take online um, where you know the presenter is giving a, a synchronous PowerPoint and then doing a Q&A at the end on the, any, on the given topic that they had scheduled. Um, so that went really well. We had about 40 participants in that, but it was kind of last minute with our marketing. So we're looking to get a few more of those up in the next month or two, um, you know, and hope to increase our numbers there. So we're also working with this idea of asynchronous and synchronous online classes. Um, so with one of our certificate programs, Conservation Gardening, we're gonna do some pre-recorded lecture um, and video with some of our uh, horticulture staff, and then kind of coupling that with a live Q&A session with them as well to kind of ease the burden on some of our staff who now just have so much work with the garden being closed, but trying to care for, you know, care for the display gardens and things like that. It's this fine line and a challenge I would love to hear others and how they've dealt with it. We use a lot of our staff as presenters for these, especially now. Um, so walking that line between not asking them too much, but also drawing on their expertise and asking for their help for some of these online education classes. Um, I'm working on our very first botanical art online class. So we offer a botanical art and illustration certificate program that's incredibly popular, um, a really passionate group of people that go through it. Um, it's also a big revenue uh, stream for our garden. So we're looking to do our first course um, with that, which I'm really excited about. It was really nice to hear Harriet uh, talk about her experiences in putting that on. Um, so really looking forward to the the challenges that that might come up there and hopefully the successes and thinking about how to move some of those courses we would traditionally do in person online to just increase reach. Um, and one thing that we've just started to try to set up is doing a kind of botanical art and illustration coffee hour where graduates of our program or others interested in art could gather together for 30 minutes or 60 minutes and do a live session where they could share their artwork, share some things that they're doing and working on you know, while under quarantine um, and a way to keep building that community and keep that community together. Um, one of the things that I found really helpful is putting together as many kind of guides and tutorials for folks on either how to teach online or how to do a Zoom meeting. Um, we use Zoom at our institution, um, you know, looking at some third party integration as well. Um, so for our BAI courses that will hopefully go online. They're all tied into our learning management system at the University of North Carolina. So that serves as a nice platform kind of where all of our kind of our data management system for each class where we can post syllabi, you know, do forums with those who sign up and things like that. Um, but yeah, I'd say right now, one of our biggest challenges um, that I've run into is getting some folks on board for the idea of online education. Um, and how it can work and how we can still offer, you know, those field components that might be a part of a traditional horticulture or conservation class um, and still, you know, provide a nice learning environment for students, especially if they're paying a fee um, to make them feel like they're not only getting the information that they were looking for, but, you know, getting their money's worth. And also that, that balance I was talking about earlier between you know, kind of selling online education to staff at the gardens, um, but also walking that line between not asking them to do too much, um, but also asking for participation at the same time. Um, so those are some of the, the things we're trying to do and some of the challenges that, that we're running into in these early days of taking some classes online. Thanks for sharing, Ben. Who else would like to share? Um, I can share. Uh, hi, I'm Cody Clifford. I'm from the Myriad Botanical Gardens in Oklahoma City. Um, I am actually here on behalf of my coworker, uh, Lily, who is our school and youth programs manager. Um, so she's more in charge of the adult programs than I am. I generally do toddler age um, and school groups with her. Um, so all of this is very enlightening. I really appreciate it. Um, all of the really cool 
topics for classes coming up because we haven't really dipped our toes into doing any live classes yet um, using Zoom in any capacity um, other than just for staff. Um, right now, we've just been focused mainly on um, video content that we can get on our social media um, and just kind of infographics and things like that. Um, so coming to this is kind of our first step into uh, what kind of adult programs we can start offering. Um, I will say I was in a, uh, another webinar the other day that was um, virtual um, experiences for students and like teachers. Uh, and they talked about Vamond, which I assumed was just kind of a school program um, online. Uh, it's kind of like you form an experience. So people have been using it for guided tours, which I thought was really cool. Um, that one's totally free. And I did take a little bit of a look at that. And it looks a little bit like um, a travel website where you would look up what to find in this city. Um, but a lot of people are using it as like, here is a color tour of our um, prairie garden. And so they'll have lots of different informational packets that you can just move through like a guided tour. Um, so I think adapting that for adults would be really helpful as well um, for, for some gardens that mainly rely on guided tours like I know we do. Cody, would um, you be able to post that um, link into the chat whenever, um, but just before, before, the, uh, before the end of the session? Definitely. Right now, but yeah, absolutely. That's so. That's basically what we, we've been working on. Um, we've always been a little bit uh, experimental with our adult programs as well, because we came kind of to the gardens, me and my team, um, to to kind of a, a mainly uh, master gardener and older generational, like have been with the gardens, you know, since it began, uh, kind of group. So reaching out to adults in the area has been a little bit tricky, trying to figure out what they are most interested in. Um, so now, of course, we have even more challenges and hurdles um, with the current climate, uh, but we're figuring that out and hopefully we'll kind of get our feet on on solid ground pretty soon. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing, Cody. Hi, this is Heather from the Greater Des Moines Botanical Garden, and I had a question about learning platforms or like learning management systems, if anyone's using those. I know Jillian mentioned Thinkific. We've been looking at um, Teachable, but I'm just curious if anyone's using anything that's um, really a standout program, and if you're not, are you feeling like, are you interested in, in, in looking into one? Uh, Heather, it's a great question, I, and I, I, I echo it. Um, I would also just add, I'm wondering if anyone has any experience with Google Classrooms as a free platform, but any experience with those learning platforms and how they're using it, I would I'd love to hear from people. Good, good question. Uh, this is Nancy at Longwood Gardens. Hi, Nancy. Hi. So uh, uh, online platform learning management, we use uh, D2L Blackboard. We've been using that for several years. Uh, we used it uh, primarily to supplement in-person classes. So our ornamental hort classes, we uh, put, put the lectures up that six week classes, we put the lectures up so people can revisit. We have additional learning material there. Um, so people can you know, practice their terminology, glossaries, instead of handing out all this material, background information, we make it available on the online platform. Um, we also uh, have transitioned when we had a couple classes in uh, progress when the shutdown came, uh, some landscape design classes, we had a couple instructors who finished out their classes that way. Um, it is a very robust platform, it's not free. Um, but we had somebody who's dedicated to that and has worked with the instructors. So we were in a good position to transition for, to that. Um, we also use that platform. We have two massive online open courses that we've had in the past. Um, one on orchids, everything about orchids, and another on everything about aquatics. We usually open up in the season that uh, accompany that in the garden. We have an ex orchid extravaganza. Again, so we would have the MOOC open during that period, and the same with the water lilies. We'd have aquatic plants. We'd have that open during our water lily season. We're opening that up all, all year um, for people to to find uh, to, another way to experience us for not being there in person. Thanks, Nancy. Um, anyone else um, have platform information uh, to share? Learning platform information. I can say a little bit about Thinkific, um, but we have just started to use it. So, um, but we had a few um, different people doing research into which platform might be the best for us right now. 
And quite honestly, we didn't even look at Blackbaud products because usually the price point of Blackbaud is just out there. So we, um, we had to look at something that wasn't a big um, cost at this time. But what we're really liking about Thinkific is the ability to integrate um, the live streaming class with the embedded content. So you can easily have videos embedded in there that they link to, or you can have surveys, you can have any amount of other documentation associated with the class as well. So um, we also ran yesterday, we ran a um, part of our garden classroom series for teachers through it as well. And that was successful. And we're working on a bigger program that's more designed for youth that really integrates activities, videos, and other games. You can, you can link to other online games as well through the platform. Um, so it, look, it looks like there's a lot of possibilities with it, but we, uh, we'd have more to share in about a month about all those different, uh, how those actually all work. Jillian, while you're on the mic here, um, I was a question I had that may have tied a little bit into a question from Ben also. Just you had mentioned maybe sort of doing some outside um, videography or sort of other, you know, and I'm just, for me, it's always been a little bit nerve wracking. It's, um, you know, there's wind, which will, you know, could hurt the sound quality or, if, you know, it's just, just so, it's just much harder to control. I'm just curious what your thought process is going into that, what kind of equipment you're thinking about or what um, backup plans you have, or just, it's just been a big, uh, an area of concern for me. I, and so I'm curious if you have any uh, thoughts to share. Absolutely. Um, so the approach that we took was to join with an organization that has been doing or a company that's been doing some of these already. So they've actually worked out a lot of those bugs. And um, so they've been hosting these some, some live webinars from the garden in the past. So to be honest, I guess we're kind of relying on their, you know, their experience in this right now. Um, but the one thing that I did find yesterday when we were doing this class for the teachers is that I found actually once I was participating in that and I was mostly an observer just to make sure that everything was going smoothly because we had our staff facilitator and we had our contract instructor teaching but I found the whole experience far less intimidating than I expected okay. right and um and then that was a massive relief to me quite honestly um because it just I felt like you just have to be ready and as educators we specialize in our flexibility and adaptability right so you really have to pull out all your skills in that regard when you're doing these live programs and what the other the other piece that was really became very apparent to me is i think it's really to our advantage to plan on it being a co-taught format so that you can really capitalize on those teachable moments. And I'll just give you a little example of this for yesterday. So the instructor was talking about seed potatoes, right? And how to plant potatoes. This is with a group of teachers in their school gardens. And she sort of, I guess she made a bit of an assumption of what is a seed potato? People know what that is. And through the conversation, somebody suddenly said, I don't know what a seed potato is. What are you talking about basically? And I wasn't the instructor, but at the same time, I had some seed potatoes that I hadn't yet planted in my garden. So I was like, hey, I've got one of these. And I, and I just held it up and showed everybody, what is this? How is it going to grow? And why do we use this? So I, and it made me really think about planning for that. You know, planning for how do we co-teach using the skills and knowledge and resources that we have in this very segregated environment that we're in. So I'm not sure how that's going to play out into other types of programs that we do, but it's made me really think, you know what, let's just, let's think about these things in a different way and how we can spontaneously support one another in implementing these classes. I, I, uh, that's, that's a great point. And, and one of the things that sort of re really resonated with me there is um, I've taught a couple of these online classes now, and I will say from an instructor's standpoint, it can be, um, it can be a lot. Um, you're sort of, you don't have the energy of a large crowd necessarily. If you have your PowerPoint up, you might only see one or two faces. Um, and having a co-host who's asking you questions, who can, who can jump in, who can be another voice to sort of play off of, um, even that has been incredibly helpful. And, I, and to your point, I, I think the more we can sort of expand who's teaching, that we can sort of create more interesting and engaging environments. So um, thanks for bringing that up. And I, I, do, I do think that this presents us sort of unique opportunities 
And so we shouldn't just sort of think about it exactly how we've always um, created these events. Yeah, thanks, Jillian. Mm -hmm. So uh, we still have about, you know, about five or six minutes. Um, still plenty of time for others to share their experiences um, or, their, or their questions. How much are you all charging for the botanical garden, or like illustration classes? I mean, they're, they're typically high anyway, aren't they? Am I on there? Yeah, well, we, we heard you, Susan. That's a, it's a good question. Oh. Um, maybe, I don't know if um, Harry would want to take that. Hey, yeah. Um, so we charge 275 Canadian dollars um, for the course. Um, but as Jillian mentioned, all of our participants, except for the mother who joined from Manitoba, was already signed up. So they had paid that, assuming they'd be taking the class at the garden. Um, but there was, out of the original participants, there was only one who was not happy with taking the course in, in an online format. format. So um, everyone that had previously paid that amount was very happy to move forward um, in the online format at the same price point. Mm. Harriet, how many weeks is that class? It runs for eight weeks. Eight weeks, okay. Yeah. And what, because we shortened it to two hours per session, um, what we've done for the third hour is the instructor is creating um, a follow-up document with a recap of everything that has been covered in the class um, and some homework tasks. So um, in the Thinkific platform that Jillian was talking about, um, there's a way to um, upload, for the participants to upload um, images uh, in a discussion um, kind of section on the class um, so they can upload their uh, their homework tasks for them to get feedback before the next class which mm. is something that Catherine our, our instructor would have been doing during the class um, oh, right. so we're just kind of breaking it down in a different way um, but they're still getting hopefully the same kind of interaction and feedback that they would have been getting in the class in person thanks yeah and just to add to that, that was part of the reason that we didn't open it up more broadly for participation because we didn't want to change that price point. But I think if we were to start this from new, we wouldn't have it at the same price. It would be a lower price. Yeah. So and you I, think I'll... Sorry, I'm I just sorry. wanted to say too, people have asked about that how-to guide. So I don't have it that you can link to it. But if you wanted to, I'm just trying to wonder how I can email it to everybody on this list. I can't upload a link right now. Do you, um, Jillian, can you just email that to me? I think you have my email, right? Yeah. And it's, uh, it's definitely using staff names from ours. So you can use it as a guide of how you might do your own kind of thing. <laughs> Got it. If you have any problems, email Jillian. Is that what I heard? <laughs> yeah. I've got using my name on it. So email <laughs> So what are you all seeing as a good price point uh, for online teaching? Just say, you know, I like the idea of uh, targeting, um, you know, the beginner gardener, uh, getting a new crowd. Um, what are you, what are you looking at for an hour instruction? Is that like $10 an hour? I'd, I'd say we'd do well, 10, 10 to $20, like 20 would be on the high end for something that's high, more technical, um, a technical pruning class or something like that. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I'd say, 10 to 20 per hour with a lot of the beginner stuff being at 10. Yeah. And to some extent, I, I would imagine that, you know, that varies across the country and garden by garden. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I would, I would expect, for some of our classes, we have kept the exact same price point and there's been no difference and that's been fine. You know, for other classes, we've maybe given, you know, a, a, maybe a 15% discount or, you know, a few bucks off of what we might have normally done that because, because we're offering it um, online, we can also get way more people in class. So mm -hmm. we might not even lose revenue from that, from that standpoint. Um, there are certain classes actually we're we're trying to do culinary which normally would have been a 60 dollars class because we're 
in person, we've got an event assistant, we're doing the dishes, we're buying food for everyone, whereas we're gonna be able to offer those at like 15 bucks. Um, wow. you, buy your own okay. you do your own dishes, but um, it's gonna be a much more accessible class. So it does vary by program, um, and, but I, I would expect somewhere between no, what you normally charge and maybe a, maybe a, slight, a slight discount um, since it's online. So who's teaching your culinary classes? Um, our culin so we, we already had a culinary arts program started. Okay. So it's, just, it's our same instructors that would have taught uh, in person. We just handpicked sort of the ones we felt like were um, gonna be the, their, their personalities would translate best um, over, over the internet. We have a few that take a little longer to warm up or sort of are better sort of uh, on one-on-one -on -one communication. And we have a few that kind of really can project you know, to a crowd have really live personalities. So we, we started with, uh, with them. And I think that's probably a, maybe a good rule of thumb if you're finding, finding instructors for this format. They have to have a fair amount of self-confidence because there's less intimate connection mm -hmm. um, in some ways. And so, I um, mean, anyone can do it, but I, I think um, you, you may want to steer more towards those bigger personalities. Yes. Um, speaking of big personalities and also culinary reminded me of this is um, we were talking with our staff the other day about um, more social media engagement, especially for adults, um, and started to think about, um, I don't know if any of you watch the, uh, the Bon Appetit channel on YouTube, uh, Bon Appetit, the uh, big wig culinary magazine, mm -hmm. um, but they do a lot of stuff that's very like personable and very um, mm -hmm now we're stuck at home, let me show you my whole kitchen and what I like to use and things like that. Um, so we have been talking about doing kind of like a house plant series or like, here's my garden. Um, and so you, if you have a uh, staff that is not too shy, uh, that might be a good idea for um, some gardens to start like, if you don't already, I know that we um, haven't done a whole lot of personable, here's who's on our staff kind of social media. Um, so if you don't already do that, uh, this is probably a perfect time, especially because I know we were talking earlier about the new gardeners popping up, um, everybody who's been previously stuck in their offices now in quarantine wanting to do some more gardening. Uh, I think it's a, per a perfect time to see what we're doing in our own homes um, with mm -hmm. such horticulture experience as we have. We are um, at 4.30. Um, this time actually went by very, very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. Appreciate you all being such active uh, participants. Um, as Christy mentioned, um, we are going to be back next week, uh, April 30th, for uh, a forum. And our goal for that is we're going to try to do breakout rooms um, with the idea that, you know, we don't want to just have a week on adult ed and just a week on summer camps. We want to bring everyone in the education community together, but then kind of put you all into smaller groups. You know, uh, we haven't set on a number yet, but maybe seven to 10 or something like that, where there can be a lot more dialogue and then have people all come back together and, and, and share. Um, and so that's the hope. Uh, we're still figuring out what our, um, you know, sort of forum presence will be going forward. So we'd love to hear from you. Did you enjoy this? Would you have preferred larger groups, smaller groups, different topics? Um, interested to hear your thoughts on that, either in the chat or through email or on the forums. Um, and so uh, let us know because we, we don't yet know exactly how we want to proceed uh, going forward. We want to be as responsive as we can to people and sort of their changing needs. So um, thank you for being here. We hope you join uh, next week so we can pick up the conversation for adult ed. Um, and with that said, I just want to leave it to Christy or Joan to see if they have any uh, final thoughts. Um, no, yeah, thanks for that. Um, Gabe, on the education board or as part of the write-up for the session next week um, has some suggested breakout topics. Um, but if anybody has an idea, another thought, please post that on the board too. We'll be uh, monitoring that and kind of making the final selection of breakout rooms, I would guess, uh, early next week. So all of that can get loaded up and organized ahead of time. Um, and Joan, I think we were just looking for a handful of volunteers to not leave the meeting if you have a few minutes just to kind of do a, a little bit of a, a dry run on the on the using the breakout room yeah i'd really appreciate that so we'll, we'll officially end the meeting if, if no one else has any other question and then i will stop recording and then uh we're just going to do two or three minutes just to to run through something so thank you